talk about the different species of owls in Pennsylvania. Pam Daimler has a Bachelor of Science degree in music education, graduating from Lebanon Valley College in Anvil in 1976. She's been playing the Celtic harp, which, Celtic harp, which I think Brian Hoover plays as well, <laughs> since 2001, and is a member of the Brandywine Harp Orchestra, directed by Janet Whitman. The orchestra plays over 15 concerts a year all over the tri-state area. She is the director and founder of Parkside Academy of Music and Dance in Parkside, Pennsylvania, celebrating 32 years of teaching music and dance to children of all ages. Pam is also a photographer and nature enthusiast and has been observing and documenting a pair of great horned owls since 2012. She presents lectures featuring her photos and videos of several different species of owls and also programs on her conservation efforts to help the eastern bluebird. She resides in media with her husband, Scott. Thank you very much, Brian. It's an honor to be here today. Thank you for inviting me. Brian Hooper and I went to high school together. So I really appreciate this opportunity. And 98% of all the photographs and videos, I took all of the videos today um, in, this in this production. Okay, first, I wanted to share with you how I, I got interested in Birds of Prey. In 2012, I began observing this red-tailed hawk family. Uh, do any of you know what building this is? It's in Philadelphia. Do you recognize that at all? Well, it's the Franklin Institute, and it's a, a window ledge on the Franklin Institute, and this big legacy of this Franklin hawk family that started in 2009, and the hawks started putting sticks on the window ledge, and then in 2011, the uh, Franklin Institute actually made a nest box for the hawks. And this was taken, this photo was taken in 2013. I was intrigued by this family and I could stand on the street and observe the, the parent come in and feed the little ones. Um, this is another photo of the three Iases that were that hatched that year. And to date, mom, the female, the four male, has raised 25 little red-tailed hawks on the Benjamin Franklin Parkway. They started out at the Franklin Institute, and as you know, urban hawks face a lot of challenges. Um, the biggest challenge is the traffic. The first mate, which we called, we named Dad, was killed on the expressway by a, a vehicle. And the second mate, whom we named T2 for Tearcell, a male raptor, um, he was killed by a train on, in th at 30th Street Station. The third mate was killed by rodenticides, poisoning. And the fourth mate, T4, is still doing well. So it's a tough life for urban hawks. But they adapt. Now in 2015, they moved to this location. Does anyone know what, what that is? What building in the city? It's the Philadelphia Museum of Art. So there's an oval called Eakins Oval in front of the museum, and that is where their nest is. This is what it looks like today. Um, and they're used to fireworks, they're used to the football draft, and all the loud concerts that go on in the museum area. They adapt to it. And this is mom on the right and T4 on the left, her current mate. And the little ones have a much different playground than most red-tailed hawks. Um, they have this beautiful, the statues where they can practice hunting and flying. On the left, we have George Washington uh, and General Anthony Wayne on the right. And the parents, what they would do is bring in rats and drop them in the hat of George Washington. And the kids would feast in the hat. And then you would find them often. In fact, if you go to the city in June, July, you'll see these little young hawks on top of the statues begging for food from the parents. <clears throat> and then they play in the fountains and on the ground. It's very interesting to observe. Here they're on the griffin on top of the art museum. And they like to sit on the little outreached paw. So hopefully someday you might see them if you travel into the city. Uh, so this is how I got started. With, and then the summer, they all go off with the great migrations. And so when they left the city, I went into the forest. And this is how I got started with owls. So now what you've been waiting for 
In the world, there are over 250 species of owls. In the North America, 19 species. In Pennsylvania, there are eight species of owls. And would any of you like to name them? All right, here's their photos. <laughs> so, you named two of them. So on the right are the four species that reside in Pennsylvania all year long. And on the left are four species that migrate it through our state and spend a little bit of time. So we'll just go through the, do you know what that one is? Bard? Barn owl? Great horned? I heard the eastern screech owl. So they're the four that reside here. And then these are the migrating birds. We have the sawwet. He's on the license plate, right? The natural resource license plate. And this one? Long-eared. Short-eared. It's, it's a tiny picture, I know. And then, of course, the snowy owl. And this past year, there was a big eruption again. And at the Philadelphia airport, there was at least four snowy owls. But I'll be talking about that in a little bit. So they are the supreme predators of the night, while other birds of prey, such as the hawks, are the daytime hunters. In this next hour, I'm going to share with you information about all eight species, beginning with the one that I know and love the best, as it was the first one I discovered in the wild in 2012, the great horned owl. So briefly, I was going to tell you how I spotted him. I was walking through the forest one e evening, it was at dusk, and I saw something fly overhead, I thought it was a red-tailed hawk at first, then I saw it land, and by the silhouette I could tell it was definitely not a red-tailed hawk. The next day I came back to the forest and I heard it hoot, and that's when I knew I was in the presence of a great horned owl. <clears throat> Oops, excuse me. This was the first photograph I took of the owl, and on the right is a tree that the owl loved to roost in, that tree was affected by Hurricane Sandy in 2012. So now it's not straight, it's leaning. And that little tiny branch right here that is supporting the tree right now. So we named this tree, my husband and I, Eileen, because it's a leaning tree. And the next thing I'm gonna to speak to you about is vocalizations, because it took me a while to determine the sex of the, of the owls that I was observing. So hooting is their territorial de declaration, and it lets other great horned owls know that the territory is occupied. Can you see, about, am I standing in front of anything? Are you, you're okay? All right. <clears throat> so a territory of a great horned owl is about one to two square miles, and the mated pairs reside there all year long. They don't migrate, they're, they're permanent residents. Um, there are younger birds called floaters that will pass into the territory in search of their own territory, and that's when the, the territorial hooting would occur. And hooting is a beautiful visual display. I will show you a, a video of that soon. Each hoot is unique to the individual great horned owl, which I think is very interesting. And if I'm out, if I'm in my home and I hear a great horned owl hooting, I can tell which one it is based on the, the hooting pattern. The best time to listen is late fall and early winter. That's when they're strengthening and forming their, their pair bonds and they're establishing their nesting territory. The male can be heard all year, but, and usually he starts hooting at dusk, but the females primarily vocal only at mating season. They make many other sounds like hisses, chitters, squawks. They clack their bills and they bark. If you are near a great horned owl that barks, you should move away. Uh, that's usually when they're feeling threatened because their little ones are nearby. Carla Bloom, she's an expert on great horned owl vocalizations and she's from Minnesota. Uh, she helped me identify the sexes of the two owls I was observing. So it turns out that the males have longer and fewer syllables in their hooting pattern. But the females are, have shorter and much, many more syllables, so we tend to talk more, the female great horned owls. Um, the, I wanna just demonstrate. This is what my, the male owl sounds like that I observe. Hoo, 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 hoo. And the female, the first female, she sounds like this. Hoo, 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 hoo. Hoo, hoo. Okay. 
not exactly like that, but I'm going to now show, share with you um, a video, the, the first video of the duet that I witnessed. And you're going to see one L and hear another one. The other one's going to start the conversation. I want you to tell me which L you see. Is it the female or the male? Just remember, the female has more syllables in her hoot, hooting pattern. Any guesses yet? What, who do you think that is? She's right. She said that one's the female, and that is. Listen. Hoo -hoo -hoo. Seven syllables in her hooting pattern. Okay, so let me move on. Come to the next slide. Okay. So uh, my husband and I, we came up with names for these two owls. I know we shouldn't name the birds, but we named the, t the king, King Tuft as a little play on words, and the queen, we named her Queen Athena because the goddess Athena is, has been, is the goddess of wisdom and has been seen holding a little owl. And on the right is a caricature my daughter drew of me with the two great horned owls. I've been observing this pair in a park near um, Lynn Villa Orchards. It's in Delaware County. It's called Indian Orchard, and that's where that tree was, Eileen. Um, sadly, during the past year, Queen Athena passed away, and a new queen, Queen Anne, stepped in as the resident female. Here she is. The reason I could tell it was a new queen was by the hooting pattern. It, and she also was a little darker in coloring. But her hooting pattern is higher in pitch and has six syllables with an em emphasis on the fifth syllable. So I'm going to show you a little video. Oh, here's a, a photo first. On the left is... Queen Anne, and on the right is King Tuft. And last winter, I heard them carry on many beautiful duets. I've seen them mate. And here's an audio. You can listen to the, the new queen's uh, hooting pattern. Ready? You can't see them, just hear them. So hers definitely had an emphasis, hoo, 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 on the fifth syllable of the sixth syllable. So that's how I knew she was different. Um, so this is a map from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology showing the areas they reside year round. They live from the tree line in Canada and Alaska all the way down into parts of South America. The great horned owl is the wi most widespread commonly found owl in North America. Their scientific name is Bubo virginianus, which means horned owl from Virginia. And they are the third largest owl in North America. The great gray and the snowy are larger. The length is about 26 inches for the great horned owl. They're about up to your kneecap, and their wingspan is up to 62 inches. They're only two to four pounds. They're, they're light as a feather because of their hollow bones. And they are the raptors of the night. They are nocturnal, but they're also crepuscular, which means they're active at dawn and dusk or the twilight hours. 
They have silent flight due to the construction of their feathers. The leading and trailing edges are serrated, so when air passes over them, there's no sound. And the habitat, they are the most adaptable owl in the Western Hemisphere, and it's easier to list places that they do not reside. So they do not reside in the Arctic tundra. They do not reside in um, rainforests or treeless prairies. But almost everywhere else, you can find a great horned owl. They prefer a habitat of mixed forest and open country. These are the two owls that are larger, great gray on the right and the snowy on the left. We do not have the great grays in Pennsylvania. Um, the snowy owl is heavier and the great gray is longer from the tip of its head to the tip of its tail. This is interesting. There are at least 10 different subspecies of the great horned owl based on variations in color and size depending on where they live. I have a friend who lives in Alberta, Canada, and the owl on the right is a Bua virginianus subarcticus, and it's much whiter in color. It doesn't have the dark reds like, and browns that the one on the left has. They're beautiful owls. So that, I thought that was fairly interesting. And he, this great horned owl nested in his backyard. They have amazing eyes, yellow eyes, almost as large as a human. They have one million rods per square millimeter, as opposed to our 200,000. So the rods are for light sensitivity. This allows them to gather much more light in dim conditions. They also bob their heads. I'm sure you've seen owls bobbing their heads. That helps to them with their depth perception and it lets them assess the scene before they take action. They have amazing necks. They can ro rotate their heads as much as 270 degrees and this uh, lets them, it compensates for their ocular immobility because so they cannot move their eyes. Um, the rotation is also, they can do that also because they have 14 cervical vertebrae and we only have seven. Owls have double that. Now, this is a little small to read, but basically if you're interested in learning about the rotation of the neck of the great horned owl, so go on and look up Johns Hopkins University study of School of Medicine. Their research team determined how they can do it. It's very interesting. We have one carotid artery, they have two. They have a carotid artery and a vertebral artery. Then they have a bypass collateral artery. So when the owl turns its head and constricts one of the arteries, the blood can go across the bypass artery up to the other one and flow into the brain. I think that's pretty amazing. And also they have air cushion vessels. That's what the scientists determined. So they don't rupture their vessel when they're snapping their, their neck around. It ensures blood gets to their brain. Few more fun facts. They exhibit reverse sexual dimorphism, which is when the male is smaller than the female. And this holds true for most all birds of prey. The female great horned owl is 10 to 20% larger than the male. The plumage is basically identical. Of course, the tufts are not their ears, they're, they're feathers, but they use them to express moods. So if I see a great horned owl with its tufts lying flat down, he's usually very calm. If it, they're sticking straight up, he's probably on edge due to crows mobbing him or something like that. So they, they can use them, and they also use them for camouflage, blends into the, the leaves and the trees. The ears are slits on the side of their heads. Their toes are arranged in a pattern called zygodactyl, which means they're... Hello, hello. Oh, there he is. Can you hear me? Good. Wait a minute. Two to okay. Two toes in the front and two in the back. And at times, the bird, the owl can swivel one of the digits in the back to the front, so it can be three and one. Um, so I think that's interesting. The lifespan of great horned owl is eight to 14 years in the wild. The record's 28, and in captivity, it's 50 in the San Francisco Zoo. They are protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, signed in the early 20th century. They are not endangered. However, I like this quote by Rosalie Edge, the time to protect a species is while it is still common. And I'm, do you, I'm sure most of you know who she is. She's an advocate for species preservation, and she founded the world's first bird 
of Prey Preserve in Pennsylvania, which is, it's right near here, Hawk Mountain. Yeah, so I enjoy, I think that's a, there's, they sell shirts with that quote on the back. Do you see anything odd in this photo? Yes, you see something hanging, what is it? A rabbit, that's right. So she, she was not moving, and I, I was able to observe her in this position for quite a while. She didn't want me to see she had a rabbit. Um, great horned owls eat an astonishing array of medium-sized animals of all types, small to medium. Here's a sample diet. Mice, rats, voles, bats, squirrels, rabbits, skunks, herons, ducks, hawks, egrets, possums, cats, and small dogs. They eat a wider variety of prey than any other owl. Over 250 species have been identified. And how do they do it? With their silent flight and their great hearing. They also have massive talons, a spread of four to eight inches across that can break bones and puncture organs. If the animal struggles, the talons dig in deeper. They also cast or eject pellets, which is anything that they can't digest, like fur, bones, exoskeletons, and lots of times children in high, junior high school dissect them to determine what the owls have been eating. I like this photograph. If you look very closely at the underside of the foot, it has little tiny bumps called spicules, and they just help the owl grip slippery fish or different kinds of food. And it also helps them on a, be a stand on their perch. It's similar to the gloves we have with little bumps on them. Okay. So the feathers may also serve. There's feathers on their feet, and that may also serve, help them with uh, the prey, see, uh, feeling the prey. Um, yes, okay. So now the, I wanted to talk a little bit about the enemies of the great horned owl. They basically are at the top of the food chain. However, sometimes other great horned owls will dispute over the territory, and if they're injured, they could fall victim to a fox or coyote. Um, but basically, man is their worst enemy due to secondary poisonings, rodenticides, traps, shootings, automobiles, planes, and destroying their habitat. There's an organization called RATS, which stands for Raptors Are the Solution. I let them have my photographs to use in publicity to help spread the word not to use rat poison. So, because eagles oftentimes will eat rodents that have been poisoned by uh, rodenticides, and same with owls, so it's sort of the mission of this uh, organization. This poster, of two baby barred owls that I gave to them to use is in a, on buses in British Columbia, in Vancouver, British Columbia, helping to spread the word. Here's Queen Anne this past December with a rabbit. And great horned owls have the lar longest breeding cycle of any other owl in North America. They mate for four to six weeks out of the year. They mate for the long term. And they start mating in November or December. They nest in January, and the eggs hatch in February. So they're very early. They do not make their own nests. They would use a hollow or a snag or a another bird's nest, such as a, a red-tailed hawk. Their incubation is about 33 days on average. They usually have two to three eggs in their clutch, and they lay them asynchronously in a different order. So they're laid in a specific order, and they hatch in, a, in, a, in the same order. The male hunts for all the owlets and, all, and the female. He's a great provider. Next, we have a video of great horned owls mating. This is King Tuft you'll see first. He is hooting to the queen, and the duet just starts getting closer where they overlap their hooting patterns and it escalates and then he will fly off. So here we go. That was a female.
And that was it. It was very quick. So this past year, um, they nested two houses up for me. It was very uh, exciting to observe um, in this red-tailed hawk nest. She began nesting February 7th of 2017, and she successfully had two little owlets. And here's a little video of, I call it cuteness overload. They were about 16 to 18 and 18 days old. It was a joy to see these little ones. Sadly, there was a bad storm, a wind storm. Both of them were blown out of the nest. Um, one was injured and is now in a rehab, and the other one did not make it. The baby owlets make a high-pitched hissing sound. They will leave at about six to seven weeks of age, and then they start flying at nine to 10 weeks. They take a very long time to become independent, and they stay with their parents until August, and then the parents kick them out of the territory and encourage them to, to start their own. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the barn owl. The barn owl has a heart-shaped face with dark eyes and no ear tufts. They are strictly nocturnal. At night, they fly over agricultural land and they search for small mammals. They're only about 12 to 16 inches in length and their wingspans 42 inches, so much smaller than a great horned owl. The males are pale all over and the females, they'll have more spots and are darker. This photo was chosen by National Wildlife Federation and you can see it on birthday cards in their catalog. The owl, it, on the card, it says, happy birthday, above that owl's face. But he, that owl was not very happy because it was being banded on that particular day. This is the map of where you may find them all over the world. Uh, they are non-migratory across most of their range, and they will nest in openings such as caves, cliff openings, tree cavities. They really ad adapt well to the artificial nest box placed in barns. They also will use silos, steeples, or even baseball stadiums. This is a barn that uh, I observed these two young owlets. They have very long legs that are lightly feathered, and it lets them, um, lets the owl snatch the animals under the snow with these long legs. And they hunt, they hover over their food, and then they'll fly down. They'll use their extraordinary hearing to capture prey. The uh, oh. barn owl's ears are asymmetrical, so the left ear is a little bit higher than the right ear. And also their facial disc, um, it sort of acts like a radar. The, it, the sound goes into the ears, it's, um, and they can use their facial disc and their uh, excellent hearing to locate their prey, even under the snow. They only live to be one to two years old. So rather than a hoot, they communicate with more of a scream. So if you would hear this and didn't know what it was, you might, your pulse might race. This is what it sounds like. And in that picture, this is where the nest box was up here in the green square. You can see the owl inside. And I have a video I'm going to show you in a second. And this was during a banding session that I went to. They were about six weeks old. They nest in March through June, but they actually can breed in any month depending on the amount of prey that's available. They can have as many as two to even 11 uh, eggs in their clutch. This is a video. If you look in the window, you'll see that little one fledge. It's going to fly out, and they both fly to the other, the square window on the right. 
So there's one on the roof. This is a very hot night. You see the fireflies. I had to wear a net all over my head. My, I wore long sleeves and gloves. The insects were really bad. Now here's the, did the other one fly here. The other one's flying out now. Here it goes. Yes, and from there they both, I can keep going on. From there they both go to the window, and that's where I took that photograph in the previous picture. That was in July of 2014. So their status in the United States is declining due to destruction of their habitat and changes in agricultural practices and also chemical poisoning. They are also very sensitive to the cold and many of them don't make it through the severe winter. Now we're gonna talk about the barred owl, my second favorite owl. I observed a pair in Ridley Creek State Park. They've been there several years in the same tree cavity. It's one of the most familiar owls in North America. It's a large, toughless headed owl. It's about 19 to 22 inches tall, and the wingspan's 42 to 44. So it's a little bit smaller than the great horns. And the great horned owl is a threat to the barred owl. They have beautiful brown eyes with white markings and uh, dark, soulful eyes, and the barred lines down the front, which gives them the name barred owls. They are a very vocal species, and they communicate with over 13 vocalizations. They are often called the vocal gymnasts of the world. The most popular common call is, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? It's the classic sound you would hear in a mature forest. Here's the call. They have many other different calls, which I'll share in a second. But this is an um, interesting video. This past uh, winter, I attended the um, International Festival of Owls, and my friend brought three owls from the World Bird Sanctuary in St. Louis, Missouri. So this is Jersey, the f a female barred owl who's 25 years old, and she's demonstrating the one phrase hoot. It's an ascending pattern of six hoots, and it ends with a hoo at the end. And they usually use this to, when, when an owl is intruding into their territory, they might, you might hear this. And at the end, you'll hear a vibrato. That's a way you can tell the female from the male in barred owls. Here's Jersey. They were laughing at her. <laughs> All right, so that was Jersey the barred owl. They are one of the only owl species of owls that perform intricate duets. This particular duet you're going to hear is called a gurgle sound or a gurgle call. And it can be very, um, alarming to someone walking through the forest because it sounds like a wild musical laugh and it can go on for hours. Pretty incredible, right? The laugh 
Sounds like wild monkeys. <clears throat> okay, this is a, a, the, from Cornell, their range. They're fish, originally a bird of the east, but during the past 20th century, they've spread into the Pacific Northwest and into California. And it's, it's ex exploded in numbers more so than any other owl uh, and in range like this species has. And they unfortunately have been taking over the territory of the northern spotted owl in California, which has caused them to become endangered. So this on the left is the northern spotted owl, and the right is the barred owl. The barred owls are slightly larger, and they have moved into California. Um, they're killing the spotted owls, and they are picking up their vocal the abilities and they're either, so it's a big problem. So the biologists in California have decided to pass a law that it's to make it legal to kill barred owls, a specific number. I believe they killed 716 in 2015, just to see if it would help. And as of now, the biologists say that it's too soon to tell. As you can imagine, it's a, it's a dilemma known as a Sophie's Choice dilemma because no owl really wins. It's a very uh, controversial subject, as you can imagine. Two thirds of their diet consists of mammals, such as rats, voles, mice, shrews, and even chipmunks. They are op opportunistic hunters, and they will take a bird as a large as a pheasant, and even as small as an earthworm. They will even snatch fish from the water. They are a, a serious threat to small owls, such as solid owls and eastern screech owls. The next video, you're going to see the adult owl bring a prey item to the baby. I want you to try to identify the prey item. <clears throat> So this is the juvenile, probably about 10 weeks old. So the adult passes a prey item to it. Now see if you can d identify that. He'll turn around in a second. And I have some close-up pictures. Does anybody have a guess? Pardon? No. Did you see the little feet? That was a baby screech owl, a baby eastern screech owl. So. It's the circle of life. The great horned owls prey on the barred owls. They prey on the screech owls. <clears throat> in 2014, the pair raised these two owlets. Normally, they have two to three. Um, the female will incubate for 33 days. And in Pennsylvania, they, late, they hatch in late March or in early April. I observed these owls practicing catching locusts in this field in Ridley Creek Park, Ridley Creek State Park. It was very fun. The, the mom would fly down and catch one, hand it off to the little ones, then they would practice. In 2016, they raised three owlets. However, two of those, only two survived. And this is called the Barred Owl Family Encounter. I'll play a little of this video for you. I was just sitting at the side of the path, and they flew down fairly close to me. They're very inquisitive.
That's their chitter call. He's probably about eight feet away from me. I can see his head bobbing. So eventually the other one flies next to him, but I'll keep moving on due to time. But it's very, uh, very fun to observe these two babies. This is my last video of the barred owl. I, my favorite video of all time. I call it Close Encounters of the Barred Owl Kind. I was sitting on the, feet, on the trail with my video camera, and he was just catching worms uh, on the trail. And then something happens. So he landed on my expensive camera. <laughs> I guess it was a good perch. <laughs> I had to just stay calm and keep videoing. His siblings up in a tree above him. He must have been there about 20 minutes. I just shortened the video. So if you're interested in seeing more videos, I have a YouTube site with all these videos on. You could look at them. He didn't hurt the camera. Um, it was actually recording, so when I watched it back, I, I heard all the scratches. It was definitely a, an unforgettable experience. <clears throat> now I'm going to move on to the eastern screech owl. This is the fourth owl that is in our state all year long. And <clears throat> it's a small owl with tufted uh, tufted owl with yellow eyes and it has a yellow bill it's only six to ten inches long and its wingspan is up to 22 inches they have a mysterious trill or a whinny sound and they also have a monotone trill here's the call of the whinny sound it sounds like a horse And they can use that for territorial defense uh, or between pairs when they're communicating. They have many other calls. And they will roost in old woodpecker holes or other kinds of cavities. They will also roost in a nest box. 
There are two main color morphs, the gray and the rufous or red, which you can see in this, in this photograph. The, the rufous screech owls um, are more common in the south. There's more gray ones here. But we do have both in Pennsylvania, the red and the, the, red and the gray. Here's their range, the eastern screech owl, and they live in deciduous and coniferous forests with a lot of tree cavities. They will also occupy woodlands near t homes and towns, and they will nest in bird boxes. Lots of times they'll use many, many cavities, one for their cache of their prey, one for roosting, one for their nest. So if you're interested in putting up a box in your yard, you might want to put up a few. They also like to be near water. My husband installed this in our backyard. So far, we have had no takers on the nest. And then this is a sycamore tree on the left where the gray screech owl is living. And on the right is a rufous screech owl. This was in uh, a park called Saul Refuge, which is near Hedgerow Theater. Unfortunately, they cut this beautiful tree down. I was very upset because it was home not only to the screech owl, but it was home to a wood duck. I saw a pileated woodpecker use this tree. Um, what else did I see? So the, there was one other one. A flicker used it, but I, what, they just cut it down because they thought it might fall on a car in the parking lot. So I encourage people not to cut down dead trees unless they are definitely in, in danger of hitting your house or something. But they, are, they provide shelter and homes for so many animals. I called it the apartment tree. They can also make themselves very thin, um, especially when they're trying to look invisible to a potential threat. Um, so if you see a screech owl very skinny and thin, you should probably back away from it. Uh, it's under some stress. They only live to be five years old. Um, they are non-migratory birds. They will eat a variety of prey from insects, to birds, small birds and mammals, and the crayfish and fish are definitely on their diet. Uh, my friend Jerry took these photographs of little, probably about one, eight, eight week old screech owls. They can have as many as three to seven eggs in their clutch. Now I'm going to start talking about the four owls that live in, that, that migrate through our state. Um, I'll make this moving fast. I know, is it getting too late, Brian? How am I doing on time? Is it okay? Okay, that's about all I need. I, I spent more time on the first four because they're permanent residents on our, in our state. So the long-eared owl, they're slender, secretive, and they're strictly nocturnal. They lead a double life, roosting in the forests at night, but hunting in the meadows after it's dark. They are similar in size to the barn owl, 14 to 16 inches long and 35 to 40 inch wingspan. They have very long tufts that stick straight up and their call sounds like you're blowing air over a bottle. Here's their call. This is their range. They, you can see up in the, in the very top and north, that's where they're going to, to um, have their, their nesting. And then they migrate south during the winter months. And they will roost together. In as many as 100 owls will roost together. Uh, so it makes them fairly easy to find. But they are nomadic. They tend to nest in different areas, but they do often come back to the same roosting areas. It's probably the least understood owl of any North American owls due to its secretiveness and its uh, migratory behavior. They sort of look like a great horned owl that's stretched a little bit longer. They are smaller than the great horned, of course. Now this is an area in Pennsylvania where I found a large group of them roosting together. And you can see it's a perfect habitat. It's the forest for night and then the grasslands for their hunting. They are small mammal specialists. They love voles and mice. 
that makes up about 80% of their diet. They need about one to three small mammals a day. And they also appear to form new bonds, pair bonds, each season, unlike the great horns that mate for life. And they will take over a raptor nest or a squirrel or a crow nest. And the status of these owls is on a slow decline in population globally. They are listed as threatened in Pennsylvania or imperiled and of special concern. Reasons could be of, due to the reforestation of the meadows or the conservation of grasslands, or not conservation, the, cons the conversion of grasslands to crops, um, things that take away their foraging habitats. They can live up to 11 years of age. Now here's the smallest of our, all of our Pennsylvania owls. That's a photograph of me. I was at a banding session at, um, in Newtown Square. It's called Rushton Farms, and they band sawwood owls every year. So they have a cat-like face, a big head, and yellow eyes. They are highly nocturnal, and they're seldom seen. They're only eight inches long, and their wingspan is 17 inches. And late at night, they give a rhythmic tooting sound. It sounds like a tr uh, truck backing up. Here's this, the call. Doesn't that sound like a truck? So if you hear that sound, you'll know what it is. Um, so at the banding session, of course, they record the, the length of their wings. They determine if they're a first-year bird, second-year bird by their feathers. Uh, so I observed a couple of sessions at Rushton Farms. Then they release them. They migrate at night through Pennsylvania in the fall and winter. They are birds of the forest. And they breed in the extensive forests along the northern part of North America, in that purple area. That's where they breed. And then they come down, they winter in the United States. They eat mice and other small rodents. And thanks to the Pennsylvania Natural Resource License Plate, the Sawet is now our state's most identifiable owl. Do any of you have that license plate? I really wish I did. I, I, we tried to get one, but I don't believe they make them anymore. But um, this one on the right, the picture on the right, I took at, at Heinz Refuge um, near Philadelphia. They live to be about five to seven years in the wild. The short-eared owl is crepuscular and nocturnal. Uh, they're seen at dawn and dusk oftentimes. They are 14 to 15 inches long and 36 to 39 inch wingspan. So it's similar to the long-eared owl and barn owl in size. Their tufts are very, very short. You cannot really see them without binoculars. They have a black, black rim around their yellow eye. And here's their call. It reminds me of a cat. And this is their range. They nest in the Arctic and the subarctic on the ground. This is the, one of the few species of owls that does make its own nest. It digs a little hole or a, a little bowl in the grasslands. Um, they usually have five to six eggs. And the, the incubation period is about 31 days. They are very nomadic, like the, the long-eared owl. And their migration is not understood very well. It remains a mystery. Um, and their population has shown a decline since the 1960s due to the destruction of their habitat. They used to be, be, uh, they used to be nesting short-eared owls near the Philadelphia airport. But unfortunately, they destroyed that area in 2005 to build a new cargo hub. You want to look for them in grasslands and prairies and open areas. They perch 
um, in low trees or on the ground, and they're mostly seen in Pennsylvania during the winter near a marshy area like Middle Creek or Lancaster County. Um, they, they eat small mammals, especially the, the meadow vole. They live about four and a half years. They also, if you, if you see a northern harrier, they tend to like the same habitat. So if you see a northern harrier, chances are you'll see a short-eared owl. Last but not least, the snowy owl. It's the heaviest owl in North America, it weighs six pounds, 23 inches long, and the wingspan can be up to 61 inches. They spend their summers in the Arctic Circle hunting for lemmings and other prey items. And in re recent years, scientists have learned a lot of new information about their migration. I'm sure you know Scott Widensall. He started Project Snowstorm in 2013. They place high-tech high GPS transmitters on the backs of these owls and that lets the scientists follow their uh, migrations. They breed in the Arctic, you can see it in the top there, in the subarctic tundra, and then they appear every winter in Canada and then into northern United States. They are very nomadic, and most of them migrate south during the breeding season, but they have been, it has been determined that many of them actually go north for migration. And the reason they migrate south is not due to a lack of food, but rather an abundance of food. So when, there's, when there are lots of lemmings, sorry, when the population, population booms, they can raise triple the amount of young. And you might remember in 2013, there was a snowy owl um, eruption. And many of them traveled into our area, down into Florida, and even Bermuda. They are very insulated, and they can survive in the cold temperatures even as, as low as 90 degrees below zero. In Pennsylvania, we can find them in fields of Lancaster um, or on the silos. They're also found at airports and beaches, and these locations remind them of the tundra, the flat open area. And during the eruption in 2013, 150 were trapped at airports, and then they were relocated. There was one trapped at the Philadelphia airport. They took it to Lancaster County. It flew back to the airport and was killed, sadly. It's very dangerous for the airplanes, of course, and uh, also for the owls. So this past year was another eruption, 2017 to 2018. There was it turns out that the eruptions are cyclical. Every four years, there's a, an increase of lemmings and lemmings, so that the snowies lay more eggs, and the juveniles migrate south. This is the Philadelphia airport in January of 2018. And I want to show you a little clip in the day of the life of an airport snowy owl. This is at Hog Island Road near Fort Mifflin. There was, I said, I think I told you this earlier, there was about four or five snowy owls at the airport this past year, and I don't think any of them were hit by any 
uh, planes or where in some places they actually shoot the owls. I think it's illegal now to do that, but um, I know it is. So they are very nomadic, the most nomadic bird in the world. They almost never return to the same nesting site. It might breed in Alaska one year, then the same owl might breed in Siberia or Canada. And I, I've shared before that most owls are nocturnal or crepuscular. Um, this owl is actually diurnal also. You can see it active in the daytime. There's only three owls that are diurnal, the northern pygmy owl, the northern hawk owl, and the snowy owl. They have varying amounts of black and brown markings on them. The males um, become pure white as they age. The females are, have more uh, bars and dark markings. The juveniles are all like little dots and dark markings. So it's hard to tell sometimes the difference between a juvenile and a female. Beautiful yellow eyes. They live to be about 10 years old. Now they are, mostly silent except during the breeding season, and here is their call. It reminds me more of a bark. And they will nest on the ground um, in an open shrub area or a tundra. They will have five to seven eggs, but if there's a lot of lemmings, they could have 14 eggs in the nest. Okay, we're coming to the end. Owls are masters of camouflage, so you might wonder how do you find an owl in the wild? Here's a couple things that you can do if you're interested. You want to look at the tree bark and down on the ground for owl's droppings. It looks like whitewash. One time I was walking and I saw a big white spot on the ground. I looked up and there was a great horned owl. So that's one way. Listen for calling at dusk. Look for silhouettes of owls. Many owls, especially great horns, love evergreens. They will roost next to the trunk. Uh, look for pellets on the ground. Listen for crows. They will mob the owls, so if you see a lot of crows circling one tree, chances are there's an owl there. Also, squirrels will do that, American robins, blue jays. So if you hear that or see that, chances are you might find a raptor. Use ESL. It takes a lot of experience, luck, and skill to find an owl. Be patient, persistent, diligent, and determined. Um, and re it's really important to remember you're in their world and on their turf, so you have to be respectful, keep a good distance from the owls. Um, if you go out on an owl prowl, you want to move stealthily and go out about an hour before dusk. Um, when it's very dangerous to play the recordings and Hooting back to owls is also, if you do it, you want to do it judiciously and not during breeding season. I had a friend who just wanted to get a picture of the owl flying at him. And so he played the owl's call. He got his picture, but he was also attacked by the owl. So I do not recommend using the calls at all. Um, yeah. It's just dangerous, and it really it upsets the owls. So these are the eight species that I've been talking about today. The first four are the ones that live in Pennsylvania all year. The last four migrate through and just spend a little bit of time here with us. And here's their photographs. So do you have any questions? Thank you all for inviting me again. Does anyone have any questions? I hope you... Thank you for coming out. You're uh, welcome. I think a lot of us don't even know that there's eight owl species in Pennsylvania. I, mean, I didn't know, I wasn't even aware of it. And a lot of the noise sounds that you hear when you're in the stand early in the season and you can't identify them, I've been able to now identify some of them. So uh, thanks, thank you very much. You're welcome. Very, very good, very informative.
This is my bibliography in case anyone's interested. They're the books that I used for research. Oh, and I have, if you would like, I have a lot of photographs that you can have. Um, you can come up to me anytime. I have them right here. And I have a, a card in case you're interested. You can look at my YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I think the commissioner's senior staff will be upstairs for executive session now, right? Thanks.